So before we start, I got this comment on the previous video asking for a certain scene from Aeon Flux. Well, I figured I'd do one better, so here you go! So after the success of the Aeon Flux shorts on Liquid Television, MTV decided to approach Peter Chong about making the show into full half-hour episodes. Quite a leap from the initial shorts, considering what would be needed. As such, in 1995, full 22-minute episodes of Aeon Flux began to air after the last of the shorts was made in 1992. The biggest change came in the fact that the characters would actually have dialogue with each other. Notably, Aeon Flux was voiced by Denise Poirier, who had been quiet in recent years, but did act in a short film called Myth, which you can watch on YouTube. My name is Aeon Flux. I'm here on a mission to assassinate Trevor Goodchild. Is everybody listening? Do you believe me? Trevor Goodchild, who was in the shorts, but now given a concrete role, is voiced by John Rafter Lee, who has been quiet in more recent years as well. I hold the future of Brynja in my hand. See it, my friends, and embrace it. Embrace the new openness. According to the DVD commentary for the first episode, this was seen as a bit contentious and worried viewers of the shorts. I could see why, considering that people were worried that the voice acting would detract from the visual storytelling that the shorts were notable for. Thankfully, the team were well aware of this and how they handled each episode. Honestly, the show itself feels more like an anthology show, considering how the stories play out. Instead of having Aeon die at the end of every episode, it's more of a mix, depending on the scenario. I mean, some of the outcomes are even worse than death itself. So when I was originally planning this video, I thought I would be able to talk about each episode in a single video. However, upon re-watching the episodes for the series, I thought it would be best to change that up a bit. I want to take a look at the first episode more in depth to present an overall vibe of the series, an overview if you will. The other video will be about summarizing the episodes and giving general thoughts to them. Already, it's interesting to note that episode 1 was actually a mandate by MTV as the first intended episode was going to be the Demiurge. That episode was moved to be the fifth episode of the series, which makes sense considering what's in it. However, I'll get more into that episode when we get to the next Aeon video. But for now, just know that the episode Utopia or Deuteranopia, Deuteranopia, hang on, Deuteranopia, Deuteranopia, Utopia or Deuteranopia was made to set up what the series was about. Let's begin by looking at the title itself, as the name of the episodes typically have a lot of meaning behind them. Utopia is a word that you hear a lot. An imagined place or state of things in which everything is perfect. Deuteranopia, though, is a bit more obscure. It's actually a type of color blindness that's marked by usually the complete loss of ability to distinguish colors. What's funny about that, as an introduction to Aeon Flux as a series, is that a lot of episodes take place in the state of Brenya, a place with very washed out brown and gray colors just like the colors seen with Dear Antropia. They easily could have called the episode Utopia or Dystopia, but that would have been way too simplistic and not convey the same idea that the episode is going for. This relates to the main theme of the episode, about people and what they are open about and what they hide. This is perfectly shown in the beginning as we hear Trevor talking about being a witness to the world. The unobserved state is a fog of probabilities. A window of and for error. The watcher observes. The fog collapses. An event resolves. A theory becomes a fact. We see a delivery truck delivering boxes. As it stops, one falls off, while a man has another box up on a ledge. He sees a situation, he leaves the box, and tries to head down. However, this leads his box to fall to the ground. Aeon then shows up, places the new box onto the truck, making the truck drive off thinking everything is fine. Meanwhile, the man on the ledge is wondering what happened. Trevor could easily have said something or intervened, but he didn't. He only surveyed the incident as everyone is left only getting parts of the story. He's content as long as he thinks he sees everything. So before I get way too ahead of myself, here's the basic rundown of the episode. Trevor Goodchild has recently become the leader of Brenya, with the previous leader, Clavius, having gone missing. Trevor says he has no idea what happened, and that surveillance will help make sure everything is transparent to make sure another incident like it doesn't happen again. Yet, shocker, he's actually the one who knows exactly where Clavius is and is using him as a, uh, romantic hideaway for him and Aeon, including a dress he made for her. Freedom from prying eyes and expectations. A private place. A 
place of our own. There's a member of his security force named Gildamir who's suspicious about Trevor, especially when he gets a hold of a secret letter that Trevor has that contains a piece of fabric with numbers on it. Gildamir decides to work with Aeon Flux to uncover exactly what's going on, though Aeon really has her own agenda separate from what Gildamir and Trevor want. There's a lot of emphasis placed on certain items switching hands, and who is doing what, which is great. It's also interesting to see what characters hide and what they're open about. Trevor, as a leader, wants his citizens to be open, but, but really only as a way to disguise what he's really doing. Such as putting the former leader into a weird body bondage gip suit. Gildamir is a bit more open since he seems to genuinely want to bring Trevor to justice and save Clavius. This, of course, means hiding details from the cameras and by extension Trevor. Such as when he picks up the letter and when he's talking to Aeon. Though his goal is the more consistent of the episode, since he succeeds in rescuing Clavius, funny thing is is that Clavius is actually the most open person in the entire episode, which is not a good thing. He wants known criminals to be let go so that they continue to traffic drugs. These citizens must be released at once. Cell block X7. These are drug traffickers, wet workers, defrauders. Are you certain? By locking them up, Trevor has shut down our base of credit. You fool. These men are my special friends. Why is it so hot in here? He also has insane ramblings in his papers that Gildamir thinks are hidden ciphers. I'm staggered by the complexity of these documents, sir. I've spent many hours trying to crack the codes. What didn't you understand? I think I have a handle on some of it. For example, the Mile High Jellyfish? That's the Upper House of Parliament, am I right? No. And the Flying Saucer Men? That's the Ministry of Justice? No, the Flying Saucer Men are the Flying Saucer Men. Narzak. Area 66, the Global Empire. He's actually hiding absolutely nothing, and yet he's one of the more dangerous people. So, Gildamir has to go against his entire goal of the episode. I just I don't know. <laughs> What's funny is that while this is going down, Trevor is watching the situation, but only part of it. The only thing he sees is Clavius falling dead and then Aeon entering the flame. He totally would have believed that Aeon alone killed him. However, at the end of the episode, Gildamir decides to be open again and say that he did indeed kill him. He used this on Clavius. Follow me! Follow him. He knows where Clavius is. He pulled the plug. Yes, I pulled the plug. I did what Trevor couldn't and saved us from the corruption and madness. After all, he can most certainly prove that Aeon did it since he has the key. Ugh. Yeah, so being open completely screwed him over. We are given focus on this key, but we also see Aeon passing something to this guard early in the episode. The implication being that the key that he thought he had was pivotal was absolutely nothing. However, he actually did give away the specific key that would have incriminated Trevor, thinking that it was just merely a clue. I had the key and I gave it back to her. I had the key and I gave it back to her. Of course, this isn't even to mention the symbolism and metatext involved with Trevor hiding away his literal true feelings for a terrorist deep inside the state. A literal inner conflict, if you will. Well, how do you like it? What a dress. I'm sure it looks good on you. You shouldn't leave that thing lying around. Never know who might end up with it. You don't know what you're meddling with here. You have no idea what this is all about. I sure don't. I thought you had an operation here. I thought you were getting some work done. Where is the smoke-filled room? Where are the sleazy characters? Where are the window dressers? Or another point where Trevor gets to be in full view of everything going on, but this time it's against his will, flipping on its head what's supposed to be happening at the beginning of the episode. There's also the moment at the very end which really seems to set the tone for the show. The ending in which both Aeon and Trevor are both on the same wavelength, only for Aeon to change hers really puts the cherry on top of what their relationship is going to be. We 
Which is actually a good thing that this episode is indeed the first, since it really sets up everything that the series will be about. It's about these two with their deeply conflicting ideals. Trevor trying to pull one over on everyone, and Aeon trying to ruin whatever it is. Sometimes it's a mission, sometimes it's ideological, sometimes it's just to get under his skin. It's like a more extreme version of Spy vs. Spy, really. We'll see how it plays out over the coming episodes in the next video.